Good morning. So good to see you. Get you situated here. Make sure I don't knock that off the desk. Hi, it's Pastor Jen here at the International Christian Fellowship of Rome. It is Thursday morning and we are in chapter 10 of our book, Be Comforted by Warren Wearsby. And uh, I'm excited for today. I, uh, hi Tim, good morning. So happy to have so many of you joining on. What we would love to do also is let us know where you're watching from. So tell me where you're watching from. And uh, I'm coming to you this morning from Rome, from the Bella Vita office at the International Christian Fellowship of Rome. And hi Helen, happy to see you as well. And so we are glad and excited Tim, you're watching from Nigeria. Awesome. Thank you for being with us. Hi, Boriana. So we are doing a book study on the book of Isaiah in the Bible, and we're using this book from Warren Wearsby called Be Comforted. Good morning, Barb. It's your birthday week. Helen had her birthday earlier. Is uh, today is your birthday, Barb? Is today your birthday? Tell us. Uh, I can't remember. I think it's... Friday? Barb, tell us if it's your birthday. <laughs> it's your birthday. Helen had a birthday. Good morning, Bettina from Copenhagen. Happy to see you. Good after tomorrow. Okay, Barb, tomorrow. Yes, so uh, happy birthday to Helen and Barb. Very special birthdays. And uh, I'm just very honored and thankful that we get to be connected this way. Um, also, uh, we are in chapter 10. So this morning as we're starting, I would like you to say, because we do this often, so everybody has to contribute, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Or gelato, if you're in Italy, uh, and maybe in other parts of Europe, I'm not sure. Um, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? So type it in the chat. My favorite flavor of ice cream is when it's really hot, my favorite flavor is limone, which is lemon. Butter pecan. Uh, uh, of gelato, my favorite is lemon, limone. When uh, it doesn't matter how hot it is, I love this one called Queen Michelle, which is kind of like a rocky road, chocolate, vanilla, crunchy. It's really good. Um, and if I'm in America, I love a plain old bowl of vanilla ice cream with chocolate syrup on it. <laughs> uh, and maybe a little coating of nuts, but I don't have to have nuts and no coconut. I don't like coconut. Okay. So you're typing in your favorite ice cream. I don't know if everybody's participated yet. Um, so let me also ask you this question. What is your least favorite food? What is your least favorite food? Um, I don't even know what my least favorite food is. Um, I guess I do. I really do not like lima beans. I love all kinds of beans. I love chili beans. I love black beans. Uh, okay, Boriana, strawberry and stracciatella. Yes, I like stracciatella. Uh, Helen, you also have to type your favorite flavor. <laughs> what is it? Um, you have to interact here, okay? Um, my least favorite food, hi Shanta, liver and onions, that's funny. I used to not like that either, but um, I've actually had it a couple times where it was pretty good, so I don't think I would eat it anymore because I know what it is. <laughs> uh, Okay, your least favorite food. Uh, thank you, Barb. Shanta, what's your favorite ice cream and what's your least favorite food? Uh, I don't really like wild game either, like squirrel and duck. and I don't like all that. <laughs> so, yes, Shanta's watching from South Africa. There's probably a little bit of delay, so as you getting the message and you see what you can answer. We'll go back and look at some of those answers. It'll be fun. Um, so this morning, as we start with chapter 10 in the book, 
I just want to say to the Lord, thank you. Oh, favorite flavor of ice cream is coffee or cafe latte. Very nice. Um, how do we find hope from Isaiah's story? In Isaiah 43, this is just kind of a recap real quick from last week. What is one way? Okay, Goriana doesn't like Gargonzola. 43, what can we learn? What is something we can be encouraged about from Isaiah? In Isaiah 43, one to seven, it says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. For I am the Lord your God. Do not be afraid. So what have we learned from Isaiah? How do we find hope in these verses from Isaiah? Why is this book called Be Comforted? Because when we're going to study Isaiah, what we can learn from the Bible is that there are prophecies and guidelines and not just guidelines but commandments from the Lord and then there are promises that if we will do life God's way these are the promises we can stand on that because he created me because he formed me because he's with me no matter if it feels like the flood waters are rising or the fire is getting hotter he said that he would be there in the midst and he's proven it in the scripture when we see that he was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was in the lion's den and delivered Daniel from that. And um, he was with Mary all the way through her pregnancy when people didn't believe that she would be carrying the Son of God, the Messiah, in this virgin birth. As we get ready to celebrate Easter, God the Father was even with his very own Son as he hung on that cross knowing that he was Jesus God. Right? He knew, I'm God, I'm, I'm going to go to my Father, I'm going to be resurrected. But as he hung on that cross, he felt every pain. He was man. He was God in the form of man as Jesus hung on that cross. And he cried out to the Lord, my God, my Father, why have you forsaken me? And yet he said, it is finished and into your hands I commend my spirit. So yes, we see that I'm not alone. And um, yes, thank you for that. Good morning, Lisa. How do we find hope in these promises? That through reading the scripture, we are reminded that we're not the first ones to go through these very difficult, very challenging storms of life. And that God already had a plan in motion, knowing even when he created Adam and Eve, that from the days forward, man would be human and they would fall. And he had a plan. He had Jesus. He had the Holy Spirit. He was ready to implement his plan at the mention of his name. And so we find encouragement that Jesus is God's servant. And so that is where we start on page 143 in our book. This is God's servant, you see? And we have about four more chapters, and we are going to hopefully be able to finish. Sometimes it takes me two weeks on a chapter, but um, I think we'll be done around Easter, maybe the second week of April. A plaque in a friend's office reads, the world is full of people who want to serve in an advisory capacity, but Jesus did not come with good advice. He came with good news, and in fact, he came with truth. This was not advice that Jesus came with. Good news that sinners could be forgiven and life could be made new. And the gospel is good news to us. But at the moment, it was bad news for the Son of God. It meant that he would come in the form of humanity and he would die on a cross for the sins of the world. And this chapter and these chapters from Isaiah 49 to 52 in the book, if you have your Bible, Isaiah 49 to 52 is what we're going to be looking at today. We see God's servant in three important relationships. 
God's servant, the Messiah, which we know to be Jesus. We see him in relationship to the Gentile nations, which would be those who didn't know him yet from 49 and 50. We see the relationship that the Messiah would have to his father from chapter 50 verses four to 11 and the relationship the Messiah would have to his people, Israel, the ones who know him, the ones who are called by him. So let's look at uh, 49 and 50. The servant addresses the nations that did not know Israel's God. It says the Gentiles were far off and only God's servant could bring them near. I want to read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Now remember, yes, we are studying the book of Isaiah, but God's word is a seamless thread from the Old Testament to the New Testament to mine and your life. Amen? So when God begins to give a prophecy or a prediction in the Old Testament, we see it referred to or coming to pass in the New Testament. And why is this important? Because if God predicted it and God fulfilled it, then we can count on God's promises to come true for you and I. This month we are talking about being ready for the trumpet. It's a promise of the Messiah to come again and to call our name. So I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. It says, therefore, remember we're talking in Isaiah about the Gentiles who did not yet know the Messiah. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth, called uncircumcised in the Old Testament by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at the time, at that time, you were separate from Christ, the Gentiles, back before Jesus came. You were even excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God. That's verse 12. I wonder if we know anybody who has ever felt like they were separate from Christ, excluded from the privileges of citizenship, foreigners to the covenants of the promise of God. People come in and they listen, but they're like, I don't really know those promises you're talking about. I don't really know that Messiah that you're speaking of or what Easter is about. It's not about Easter bunnies and Easter eggs. And so it says in verse 13, but now, somebody type in, but now. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near to the blood of Christ. Isn't that powerful? For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law and the commandments and the regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this body reconcile them to God through the cross. See, even in the New Testament, the writers were saying, you used to feel like you didn't belong, but now, but now Jesus has become the chief cornerstones. Look at verse 19 in Ephesians chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and the members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. And in him, you too are being built to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's why the scripture says, our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. So now today, may you know you are not an outsider, you are not without citizenship, that those things that God spoke of in the Old Testament, Jesus came to make us one, that we would no longer be outsiders, we would be insiders with Jesus, amen? Everyone can be an insider with Jesus Christ. They are not outsiders. And so we see that Christ confirmed God's promise to the Jews, but he also extended God's grace to the Gentiles. 
Okay. In this message, God's servant explains his ministry as bringing light in the darkness. So let's look at Isaiah 49 verses 1 through 7. It says, listen to me, you islands, and hear this, you distant nations. You know, that could even be speaking to someone who feels like they are distant. I'm far away from the promises and the covenant of God. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my birth, and he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth. Now we're talking about the future redeemer. This is um, Isaiah having a word about the servant of the Lord, okay, in Isaiah 49. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, and in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have strength, my strength in vain for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hands, and my reward is with God. Before the servant, the Messiah, was born, God had chosen him to bring the light of the gospel, the message of salvation. Christ offered salvation to all the world. Now you say, Pastor Jen, how do we know? That's what the Bible is referring to. Well, I'm thankful that we have many, many, many Bible scholars who have spent years and years meditating and looking at the Old Testament verses and the New Testament verses. And uh, I'm telling you that when you have a good Bible, like this Life Application Study Bible, it's an awesome version, um, you can make reference to what God is talking about. So we see that he is speaking here in Isaiah 49 about the promise of the future redeemer. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back and gather himself, I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. It is not too small a thing for me to make a light for the Gentiles that they will bring, that I will bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And the Lord says, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nations, to the servants of rulers, kings will see you and rise up, princes will see and bow down, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel has chosen you. You know, I love to read scripture in three different ways. I like, and this is what we're talking about in this chapter. We read about how God was being revealed to the people in that day. So the Bible as literal and relevant to the time period. Then we see the Bible as symbolic to what God is saying in the heavenlies about his, his picture of doing life with us as God the creator, as God the redeemer. And it is a thread that runs from the Old Testament to Revelation, the very last word, that God had a plan for the redeemer and the Messiah to come. And then we read it and we say, I could put my name in there. I could say how Jesus lived on this earth so that I would know I can live on this earth because of the cross of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ and the redemption of Christ and the hope of Christ. Um, I can also be God's servant according to what this is saying. So in this message, we see how he was saying, I'm going to be the light. Amen. In verses one through seven. Then he explains how he will bring liberty to the captives in verses 8 through 13. And to the captives, it says in verse 9, come out and to those in darkness be free. So sometimes we get intimidated to read books in the Old Testament. But if you break it down verse by verse, I love to be able to write in my Bible. And I want you to see this for a minute. You just got to see this, okay? So this is how I write in my Bible. I know you might say, oh my goodness, but I remember it. For those of you that know my story, now I didn't plan it, but I'm looking in my Bible. I see the comfort in Isaiah 49, verse 13. He says, shout for joy. Here it is, be comforted. Isaiah 49, 13. Rejoice, O heaven and earth. Burst into song, O mountain, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion 
on the afflicted ones. Are you afflicted today? Are you in mourning today? Are you grieving something today? Are you feeling weary? He promises that the Lord would comfort his afflicted, his people and have compassion. Zion may say the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. I have engraved you. Look at verse 16. I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. That's Jesus. That's the Redeemer. Those scars on his hands were engraving our name for the redemption and the forgiveness of sins. But I wanted you to see that in Isaiah 49, verse 25, I wrote in my Bible, he will save, and I put my daughter's name, and I dated it. May 16th in 2002, I didn't know where she was. I didn't know what was going to happen. But the Lord said, the captives will be taken from the warriors and the plunder will be retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save. I didn't know I was going to see that this morning. Can I just tell you that when I wrote that in my Bible, that God was saying he would save my children. He would contend with those who had harmed them and hurt them, that he is the one who gives comfort and that these verses we read are not good for a one time only and then they're used up. This is a renewable past that you can use on a regular basis. You need to type that in the chat. God's word is a renewable path to truth. You know, here in Italy, we have to have, in Rome, we have to have a bus pass, a metro pass. And every year you have to pay for it, or you have to renew it on a monthly basis, or you have to pay for it on a daily or weekly basis. This word of God is true and free. It is renewable in every season of your life. God's word is a renewable path to grace, to forgiveness, to truth, to comfort, and he promised that he would contend for those things that are waging war against us. It is a renewable path to truth, and we thank God for that. We also see that he would bring love and hope to the discouraged, even in, in the beginning of chapter 50. Then we see that he will be the light in the darkness. I'm on page 144 in our book. What right did God's servant have to address the nations with such authority? From before his birth, he was called by God to his ministry. And I'm not going to read it right now, but we will see that in Jeremiah 1.5, in Galatians 1.15. Amen, Barb. Amen, Lisa. And God prepared him like a sharp sword and a polished arrow. The Messiah came as both a servant and a warrior, serving those who trust him, but ultimately judging those who resist him. And this is the holy fear of God that we must never lose. We thank God that he loves us. We thank God that he comes as a servant to minister to us, but we must honor and revere him that he is also a warrior who will judge those who choose to deny the ways of God, deny the holy living that's guided for us in the word of God, not as a guide, not as advice, but as commands. You do this in remembrance of me, and I will be your Savior, Jesus said. So we see that all of God's servants should be prepared weapons. That's why we say ready, 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 ready. If we are prepared, we are ready for battle. We are ready for victory. I'm going to get my bookmark. We are ready. It doesn't just mean that I'm ready for all the good stuff. It means that I'm ready for the battle. And our verse is Psalm 108.1. I'm ready, God, so ready from head to toe, ready to sing, ready to raise a God song. So if you're struggling, you need to say, you know what? I'm ready to sing a song of victory. If you're happy, you sing that song of praise. But I want you to know that he will be a light and he wants us to be prepared. Um, a holy minister, this author wrote, is an awful weapon in the hand of God. If you can be holy, if you can seek God with everything within you, the Lord will use you 
as a weapon of spiritual warfare to bring light to darkness, to dispel the darkness, not to bring weapons of hostility and division and chaos. The Lord wants to use his children to win the war on hatefulness and sickness. The Lord wants to use his children to bring love as the victory cry. The Lord wants to use his children to bring love as the victory cry. It says that the Jewish nation was called to glorify God and to be a light, but they failed in that mission. And this is why Messiah is called Israel in Isaiah 49, three. He did the work that Israel was supposed to do. And today the church is God's light in the dark world. Matthew 5, 14 and 16. As Jesus ministered on earth, especially to his own holy people in Israel, there were times when even he thought his work was in vain. The religious leaders opposed him. The disciples did not always understand his methods. In fact, some betrayed him. Um, those he helped did not always come back and say thank you. But he lived and labored by faith and God gave Jesus success. The Lord wants to give you success, but we have to honor the Lord. I want us to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Our Lord could not minister to the Gentiles until first he ministered to the Jews. You can read carefully Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 3 and 13. But here's what it says in Romans 1.16. When our Lord Jesus returned to heaven, he left behind a believing remnant who carried on his work. We must never forget that salvation is of the Jews. That's where Jesus' lineage came from. If we diminish that, we diminish the word of God. So what does Romans 1 tell us about that? Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, you know, as we think about God's chosen children and those who follow him, and the Lord gives a very specific thing that's happening, I think we can also, here's that symbolism moment. Think of ourselves as the chosen ones who have had the freedom to know God's word. We have the liberty and the means to purchase Bibles that we can read and study. We have technology, which isn't free, by the way. We pay for uh fast web and different things to help us be online. But here's what Jesus came to do. Be a light in the darkness. Type that in the chat for me. God wants you to be a light in the darkness. Be a light in the darkness. Now, I'm going to show you something. I don't know if you'll notice this. I have a light on this way. I have sunlight. You see that sunlight coming down on my hair. Um, there's sunlight there, but I want to see see that did you see that darkness come on me let's show you again there's light there's a light that brings more light and when when even one I have some lights behind my head you see that darkness you say yes I see that pastor Jen I see that darkness you see that one little light even though there's all kind of light around me hmm God wants us to be a light in the darkness. So there may be darkness in your family. There may be darkness in your situation. But I want you to think about something. When you are carrying the light of Jesus, you walk into that place of darkness, into that situation of darkness, and you bring light. You bring light by your smile. You bring light by your countenance. You bring light by your faithful thinking, things that you think with faith, not by eyesight, but by what you know God could do. God can work a miracle in anything. If God could take Rahab, a prostitute, and deliver people, don't you think he can deliver us from the things that have brought us darkness? 
And he wants us to walk in the light. So I want you to see that your light matters. Your light matters. It's better with more light on. It's better with more light on. So the Jewish nation was called to glorify God and be a light, and they failed, so the Messiah did that. And Jesus went through some things, but he said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I will bring light. In Isaiah 49, go back to 49 now. Um, okay, sorry, I lost my place here for a minute. Isaiah 49, verse 9. Isaiah 49, verse 9 says to say to the captives come out and to those in darkness be free they will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill so god has a plan even when it seems like there is barrenness amen even when it seems like there is barrenness god has a plan to bring redemption and that is a powerful thing we can see that God wants to bring liberty to the captives, light in the darkness and liberty to the captives and love and hope to the discouraged. So we have to be the light in the darkness and we have to bear the good truth of Jesus to bring liberty to the captive. That's why it says the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us. How does this apply to the Gentiles? If God had not restored the people, the city, and the temple, he could not have fulfilled his promises concerning the Messiah. Messiah. Had there been no Bethlehem, would he have, where would he have been born? Had there been no Nazareth, where would he have grown up? Had there been no Jerusalem and no temple, where would he have gone? Where would Jesus, that child, have gone to talk to teach? In verse 10 through 12, look beyond the deliverance from Babylon into the future glorious kingdom. So 49, 10 through 13, begin to say, Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion. So let's go on to number three, love and hope to the discouraged. We see that even in the final verses of chapter 49 he says in 49 22 i will beckon to the gentiles that's me i'm not jewish i'm not from israel amen yes shanta you see the light amen um i will lift up my banner to the people and they will bring their sons in their arms and carry their daughters on their shoulders Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you, their faces to the ground. They Then you will know that I am the Lord. Very important verse, Isaiah 49, verse 23. Isaiah 49, verse 23, only that last part I want you to see. Those who hope in me, then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. If we are going to bring love and hope to the discouraged ones, we will know that the Lord promised, as he did in verse 13, I will comfort the people. He promises in verse 25, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to contend with those who are making your life miserable. And this was the promise I wrote in my Bible on the margins of May 16, 2002, when I didn't know what was gonna to happen to my beautiful daughter who had been taken and hurt and abused in so many ways. And he says, then people will know that I am the Lord. I am your savior, your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. You know, it's not fun to have a story where you feel discouraged. It's not fun to have a story where you feel unloved. But remember that's only one chapter in your story. The hard part is only one chapter in the book of your story. The hard part is only one chapter in the book of your story. God wants you to keep writing your life story with him. And there will be a new chapter, as I can attest to, as Pastor Rick can attest to, as many of you can attest to. God is not done. 
and he is bringing a redemption plan to your situation. We will bring love and hope to the discouraged ones. The Lord assures them in these passages that he compares himself to a compassionate mother, a courageous warrior, and a constant lover. Isaiah 50 brings the prophecy. Listen, when we place our confidence in our own intelligence, appearance, or accomplishments, we risk torment later when these things fade. Can I say that again? When we place our confidence in our own abilities, in our own intelligence, in our own appearance or accomplishments, instead of God, we risk that we will be tormented later when those things fade in our lives. You know, I can't believe that I'm in my 60s. I honestly, my mother died when she was 39, and I just never, ever imagined my life older than my mother. And I can say to you now, I do not base my life on my condition, on my ability, on my appearance. Um, I told someone today, I changed clothes six times today trying to figure out the weather, the coloring, the on-camera, off-camera, will it be hot, will I be cold? I don't base my value on me. I base my value on the fact that God created me, God loves me. Jesus went to the cross for me and for my healing when I'm sick. And he gave me his precious Holy Spirit to comfort me. We can be comforted through the words of God. So we are to be a light in the darkness, to bring liberty to the captive, and to bring love and hope to the discouraged. But I don't want to get stuck on that one part. I love to say all the good stuff. Jesus is wonderful. He engraved our names on his hand. We know that. You can read page 146 in your book. But I want you to also look at 49 verses 24 to 46, which I already read to you, that he would contend. He is a courageous warrior. He would set captives free. That's not easy. That's not easy to break somebody out of prison if they've been in bondage, if they've been kept kept in captivity. That is him saying, I will set the captives free. And the fact that God permitted Babylon to conquer his people, listen, did not mean that God was weak or concerned. When the right time comes, he will set his people free and they will not be ashamed. They will wait for me, it says in verse 23. It says in verse 50 that he is a constant lover. And we see the image of Israel as the wife of Jehovah. It's a symbolism, okay? That Israel was married to Jehovah when they accepted the covenant, but they violated that covenant and divorced God, so to speak, when they began to worship idols. God did not forsake them, even though they were unfaithful to him. You know, that's a really amazing thing picture to think about God as the husband. It says that he will come for us as the bride of Christ. And so there are many things that we see in this portion of scripture. But God had not sold his people. By their sins, they sold themselves. God calls us to a certain way of life. And when we choose to set those idols up before God, it's as though we are divorcing ourselves from our husband, our redeemer, our the one who loves us so much. So I want you to look on page 147 in the middle. It says, how could the people say they were forgotten and forsaken? When the Lord is a compassionate mother figure in our lives, he's a courageous warrior. He is a constant lover. He is faithful to his word even when we are unfaithful. He is faithful to his word, even when we are unfaithful. He is faithful to chasten us when we rebel. We see that in Hebrews chapter 12. And he is faithful to forgive us when we repent and confess. And we see that in 1 John 1, 9. The servant's message to the Gentiles, remember we're in this passage of Isaiah now, where he's talking to the Gentiles, was one of hope and blessing. 
He would deal with the people so that they in turn could bring God's blessing. They could bring that light into the darkness. So when we read, we put our name in there. God, am I like Israel? Am I chosen today? Am I trusting you? Or am I looking at idols? Am I like the Gentiles who you had a plan to redeem and to set free? But even in that, we forgot to worship you. Lord, I do not want to divorce myself from the covenant that God has made for me. I want to be in covenant with the Lord. The second thing we see, we're on page 147, is that he's a servant and the Lord God. In the first two servant songs in chapter 42 and chapter 49, we see some of these hints of opposition to the Messiah's ministry. But in the third song, his suffering is vividly described. And when we get to the fourth song, we will be told not only how he suffered, but why his suffering is necessary. So I want to read Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15. You might remember this verse. It's a popular verse. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, you watchmen, lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. But I want you to look at verse 13 through 15. You see, my servant will act wisely. This is the suffering and the glory of the servant Christ Jesus. The servant here is used as the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, he would be exalted because of his sacrifice. Remember, this is a promise and a prophecy being predicted in, in, the, in Isaiah, in the Old Testament. The servant Christ would be marred by human likeness, but through his suffering, he would cleanse the nations. And you will see that in Hebrews 10, 14 and 1 Peter 1 and 2. So you might want to go back and hold that. Write that down in your notes. Hebrews 10, 14, and 1 Peter 1 and 2. This chapter speaks of the Messiah, Jesus, who would suffer for all people. Such a prophecy is astounding. God works in ways that we don't expect, and the Messiah's strength to conquer sin is exhibited in his humility, his suffering, and his mercy. His strength to defeat and conquer sin and sickness is revealed in his willingness to suffer, to endure pain. You see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form was marred by human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. This is the prophecy of the Messiah's suffering that we see. Servant, the Lord God. That the emphasis is on the servant's submission to the Lord God in every area of his life and service in every area of his life and service. You know, I wrote something else in my Bible and in Isaiah 52 verse 12, it says, you will not leave in haste or go in flight for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. So he will be in front of you and behind you to shield you and protect you, but he wants you to be holy and to trust that the Lord God has actually made an example for all of us to be that servant and to be in submission to the Lord. His mind was submitted to the Lord God. We see that in Isaiah 50 verse four. Everything Jesus said and did was taught to him by his father, okay? His mind was submitted to the Lord. So I'm gonna ask you, how can you submit your mind to the Lord? I want you to type it in the chat. How can you submit your mind and your thoughts to the Lord?
how can you submit your mind and your thoughts to the Lord? I hope you will type that in the chat. Our book says in Be Comforted, page 148, the servant learns to pray to the Father for guidance and to meditate on the word. What God taught the servant, capital S, Jesus, the servant sets a good example for all who would know the importance of quiet time with the Lord. The servant, Jesus, set an example for us. Today, this might be your quiet time with the Lord. Yeah, Barb, <laughs> having that quiet time in prayer. That's how we submit our minds to the Lord God. You can pause. You don't have to make that decision in haste. It says right there in Isaiah 52, verse 12, don't do it in haste. Wait on the Lord. Seek the Lord. It also says that the servant's will would be yielded to the Lord God. But the servant did gladly the will of the Lord God. This was not easy for him. It meant that he would be mocked and whipped and spat on. We see that in Matthew. The servant did all of these things, yielding to the Lord. Yes, yes, Lisa, surrender through prayer. Amen. Yes, listening to sermons and praying and reading. Amen. As the Father leads, I love it. The servant did all of this through his faith in God. The servant was falsely accused, but he knew that God would vindicate him. He did not use his divine powers for selfish reasons, but he trusted God and depended on the power of the Spirit. I'm on the last paragraph on page 148. It says, his faithful ones were perplexed at what God was doing, but he assured them that their faith would not go unrewarded. Dr. Jones often said, never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. Isn't that so true? And in obedience to the Lord, you may find yourself in a moment of darkness for do not panic. He will bring you the light you need at just the right time. Today, I wasn't planning on using this, but this is the light off. This is the light on. It's a subtle difference, but let me tell you, that's the difference your life makes in someone else's dark place. So we see that the servant of God was Jesus. He was a servant to those who didn't know him through the Gentiles. He was a servant to the Lord God and his call upon him. I would also like to say to you, maybe the Lord is saying, I need you to be a witness. I need you to be in the world, but not of it, not fellowshipping with it. But I also need you to be in communion with the Lord God. And then he says, the servant and his relationship to Israel, we see on page 149, and he gave them. These were people who knew God. They knew, they had witnessed miracles. And yet this section from Isaiah 51 to 52, and, and we see even in chapter 53, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, again, talking about the Messiah in chapter 53, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see after the darkness, he will see the light and he will have the light of life. By his knowledge, the righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities and therefore I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong. He poured his life out into death and was numbered among transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. In 5311, my righteous servant will justify many tales of the enormous family of believers who will become righteous, not by their works, but by the Messiah's great work on the cross. Isn't it awesome to see that Isaiah wrote about the Messiah, Jesus, before he ever came to this planet? Isn't that amazing? 
years and years and years before he came, generations before, but there would be a future glory. And so I want us to look as we finish today quickly, what were the several admonitions that God gave? One in 51.1, he told them to hearken to me. Hearken to me, listen to me. God called them alone, but from these two elderly people, <laughs> Abraham and Sarah, came a whole nation. The remnant leaving Babylon was small and weak, but God was able to increase them to a mighty nation and turn their ravaged land into a paradise. Be comforted, God said to his people. The best is yet to come. Pastor Rick has been saying, my best days are ahead of me. I believe this will be my best year. And this is what the Lord was saying. Listen to me, hearken to me. In the second command, God told them to look ahead and realize that justice would come, but they would be vindicated. Note the emphasis in Isaiah 51, four and six on the word, my people, my nations, my justice, my righteous, my arms, my salvation. This is the grace of God. The arm of the Lord is a key concept in Isaiah's prophecies. We know that heaven and earth will pass away, but God's righteousness and salvation will last forever. When Messiah returns, ready for the trumpet, ready for the return, and establishes his kingdom on earth. And the third admonition in chapter 51 focuses on looking within, where we find either fear or faith. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. And then we see that he says, awake, 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 rouse them for the Lord. Amen. In 51. The remnant in Babylon prayed as though God was asleep and needed to be awakened. They wanted God to bear his arms, but God replied to them with words of comfort that we saw in 51 uh, verse 12. I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you fear mortal men? that you forget the Lord your maker who stretched out the heavens and the earth, that you live in terror every day. This is from Isaiah chapter 51. And we see that he is listening. He asked us to listen and then he says, listen to me, I have it covered. God says, I have it covered. Then we see that in verse 17, it says, but you need to awake, awake and realize that there are things that will come upon you. And who will comfort you in the middle of destruction and famine and sword? But hear this afflicted one. This is what the servant, sovereign Lord says. I have taken out of your hand those things that would make you stagger. I've taken away that cup of wrath that you will never have to drink again. I will put it in the hands of your tormentors. Fall before me that, that, that you will walk over them and I will make you back like the ground of a street to be walked on. Awake, awake, O Zion. Clothe yourself with this strength, he says in 52. Put on your garments of splendor. Shake off your dust. Free yourself from the chains on your neck. And the sovereign Lord says, how beautiful on the mountains are those who bring good news. Okay? So he's telling us to listen to me. He's telling us to wake up. I've got words of comfort from you, for you. Why are you afraid of these people? Why are you afraid of this famine? But he's going to bring people who need to bring hope and light, light into dark places. And the third wake up call is in Isaiah 52. Wake up and dress up. It's not enough for her to get out of her sleeper, but she must put on her glorious garments. Amen. And this will occur. The fulfillment of this promise will occur when the Messiah returns and asks for the bride of Christ to join him. The city of Jerusalem is called the holy city eight times in scripture. I want to say that again. This is in our book. Somebody might help me. Um, I'm on page 151. The city of Jerusalem is called the holy city eight times in scripture. Nehemiah 11.1, Isaiah 48.2 and 52, 
Daniel 9, 24, Matthew 4, 5, 27, 53, and Revelation 11, 2. It has been set apart by God for his exclusive purposes. But when his people refused to obey him, he ordered it to be destroyed, first by the Babylonians and then by the Romans. During captivity, God's name was blasphemed. Paul quoted Isaiah 52, 5 in Romans 2, 24. But when the remnant is restored, they will know God's name and seek to honor it. I, I highlighted that in my Bible, in my book. Have you been restored? When the remnant is restored, thank you, Helen, they will know God's name and they will seek to honor it. I ask you today, are you letting your life seek to honor God? Are you getting caught up in so many things on social media, in so many things in news and politics, in so many things in medicine and everything else that you find yourself joining in with these negative conversations? God was saying to his children, you have been restored. Now I want you to be the light in darkness. I don't want you to add to the darkness. I want you to be the light in darkness. I want your mouth to declare the works of God. I want your life to be a witness of the, of the love of God. I want you to honor God. And lastly, he says in 52, seven and 12, depart, depart. So he says, hearken to me, awake, awake. And then he says, depart, depart. For decades, the remnant had suffered in a foreign country without an altar or a priesthood, but now they would return and rebuild their temple and restore their God-given ministry. It has been well said that the good news is for sharing, and this is what was happening in Jerusalem. The leaders were taking up the message and singing together for the glory of God. The remnant prayed for God's holy arm to work, and he answered their prayers. And so it may seem strange that God would have to urge his people to leave a place of captivity, but some of them had grown so accustomed to Babylon that they were reluctant to leave. Wow, that is a message right there. Listen to me. We're going to close. I have three minutes. I'm on page 152, and we will start next week on chapter 11. But if you've got the book, I want you to listen to what he said. His people... He wanted to urge his people to leave the place of captivity, but they had grown so accustomed to the wicked ways in Babylon that they were reluctant to leave. God was commanding them to depart. He warned them not to linger. Get out quickly while they have the opportunity. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from Babylon and be pure, it says in Isaiah 52, 11. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. And remember, the Lord will go before you. You know, sometimes I think that we're afraid to leave those people groups that have a lot of darkness in them because we're afraid we might be alone. Can I tell you, the best friend you'll ever have is the Messiah, Jesus. The best comforter you will ever know is the Holy Spirit who is with you at the mention of his name. And when you become a part of the remnant of believers who are not afraid to, to be the light in darkness, I will not let the darkness swallow me up. I will remove myself. I will listen to the commands of God when he said, touch no unclean thing, come out. This is a good command for all of us as the servants of God to obey. If we defile ourselves, we are defiling the work of the Lord. How tragic for a holy ministry to be a source of defilement to God's people. The prophet added a final word of encouragement. The Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your reward. If Isaiah had prepared the way for the heart of God's revelation, of the servant Messiah. I want you to look real quickly with me. I have two minutes. Isaiah 58, verse 8. Isaiah 58, verse 8. Here's what the Lord says about our light. Okay? It's also talking in Isaiah 58 about fasting and seeking the Lord. But here in verse 8 it says, 
when you've done all these things to draw close to the Lord, then your light will break. There's that word again, light, 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 light. Your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. You will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Here am I, here am I. You know, we go on to read in Isaiah 58, the promise and the, and the commandment. God wants you to be a conquering warrior. He wants you to be a confident warrior and he wants you to be a courageous warrior. I need to say that again as we close. Follow the lead of Jesus Christ, be a conquering warrior. Be a confident warrior and be a courageous warrior. You will not walk alone. You will see victory and you will be comforted in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless your people today. Thank you for the privilege to study your word and to follow the guidelines of someone who, even in 1994, had some prophetic words for us in 2021. We don't have to fear famine or chaos. We are conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We are confident in God and we will be courageous. I love you and happy birthday week, Barb and Helen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day.